things we, um, a lot of folks don't realize is how do all of those propositions get on the ballot in the first place? And I actually think it's really important to understand how they get there to decide how you feel about them because they get there in very different ways. Um, so what is a proposition? It's a chance for the people of California, for the voters to have a say on what they want to be the law of their state. It's a chance for us to have a say. But they get there in different ways. We have 12 propositions on the ballot and um, they're very different in terms of their paths. So what probably most people think of when they think of propositions, it's what we love in California. We love initiatives. And this is something that not every state allows. I tell my students, I'm from Texas and I got out here and I was like, what's going on? What are these people doing? Why are they voting on all of this? We don't do this in Texas. It's not what we do. This is something California does. Only about half of the states let their voters put initiatives on the ballot. So if something is an initiative, it was created by the voters. Some voters, a group got together and they thought there ought to be a law. They wrote it. And the big thing they did was they collected signatures. So in California right now, you have 180 days, about six months, to get the signatures that you need to get an initiative on the ballot if, that's, if you want it to be a law. And we have two types of initiatives. It could be a statute. A statute is just a regular law. And if that's the case, then you need signatures equal to 5% of the last vote for governor. So they have to be signatures of registered voters. And right now, given what the vote for governor was in 2018, you need um, 623,000 signatures which actually means you need to collect a bunch more because this, this is the people standing outside of Target and Walmart getting signatures. And um, you need actually more than that because almost certainly some of the signatures won't be valid. So you need to get a lot of signatures in six months, which is actually really hard to do. If you want to propose an initiative that's a constitutional amendment, that is actually changing the amendment of the, the constitution of the state of California, that's an even higher threshold. You need 8% of signatures from the last vote for governor, still in just 180 days. So right now, that is just shy of 1 million signatures, which means you need to get over a million so that you make sure you have enough. Um, so that's the basic idea. If you, get, if you get enough signatures, your initiative goes on the ballot the next time there's a general election like we have right now. Uh, coming up in November 2020, and it's a simple majority vote. If a majority of voters say, yes, we think this should be a law, it's the law of the state. Here's the thing, and this is where California is unique. Well, California is unique in a few ways, but um, when we pass something by initiative in California, the only way it can be changed is by another proposition. It requires another vote of the people, and we're kind of unique in that. In every other state that has initiative statutes, the, the legislature can actually come back and change the proposition after a waiting period, like two or three years. They can go back and change it if it turns out it needs to be fixed. In California, we can't do that. It requires another vote of the people. And I'm gonna be really honest with you all. This is not a partisan stance I'm about to take. This is a political scientist stance. For this reason, I almost always, personally, personal opinion, I vote no on initiatives. And I tell my students this, I tell everybody this. I pester my husband and I tell him, vote no. I think, and most political scientists think, this is a terrible way to make policy. That, and, and that means both parties are mad at me. So it's not a partisan stance. Everybody ends up mad at me when I say this. My students hate it. They get very mad at me. Um, but there's no there's no room for compromise there's no room for fixing it if we realize there's a problem when we pass policy through the normal legislative process it is not perfect there are many problems with the normal legislative process but when we realize it's not working we can go back and fix it with initiatives we're stuck until there's another vote and um so there's no there's no compromise it's, it's a very blunt instrument and we can end up stuck with policy that's not very good. So that's my personal opinion. Um, the main exception is I will vote yes on an initiative if it's fixing a previously bad initiative. But other than that, almost always I vote no, personal opinion as a political scientist. But you'll actually find most political scientists feel the same way. We don't like it. We think it's a bad way to make policy. All right. 
that's the now now that I'm unpopular, we'll keep going. Okay, because uh, Californians love their direct democracy, so they don't like it when you call it into question. The other uh, another way a proposition can get on the ballot is through what's called a protest referendum. A protest referendum is when um, the legislature passed a law, a regular statute, and there's somebody who doesn't like it for whatever reason. They think it's a bad law. They can again collect signatures. So it's actually the same number of signatures. You need those 623,000. You only have 90 days though. It's a really tight time frame. But if you can get the signatures in 90 days for a statute, you can force a vote on the law. And then the people get to have a say on whether or not they want it to become a law. We don't do this a whole lot because that 90 days is such a tight time frame. But we do have one of those on the ballot this time. We, we use them occasionally um, and we have one on the ballot. So a protest referendum means it's passed the legislature, but somebody didn't like it. So they're giving it to the voters to have the final say. But normally the voters wouldn't have voted on it. Normally it just would have become a law and we would have been finished. Um, but somebody forced a protest referendum on it. Then the other type of proposition is what's called a legislative referendum. This is pretty standard. Um, this is actually pretty much every state does this. So this is not anything unusual. So this is when the legislature passes a law, but for some reason it is required to go to the voters for their approval as well. So most commonly we see this as a constitutional amendment. If the legislature passes a constitutional amendment, it then automatically goes to the people for a vote. You cannot change the constitution of the state of California without a vote of the people. Um, so we have some of these on the ballot uh, this time, and this is pretty much every state does this. So this is not anything unusual, a legislative referendum, but the protest referendum and initiative, only about half the states do that, and we use it a lot more than almost everybody else. So that's why we end up with so many propositions on the ballot, and other states don't have nearly as many. For all of these, it's a simple majority vote. If a majority of Californians say yes, then it passes. Um, otherwise, it fails and it does not become a law or it does not change the state constitution. So um, those are the basics. And I think it's important to understand that because I'm gonna tell you, what we're gonna do is walk through each proposition and I'm gonna tell you the basics of what it's about. And I'm also gonna tell you what different groups are saying, how they're, they're suggesting you vote on it. And in deciding how you wanna vote, I think it's important to know how it got there. If it's a legislative referendum or a protest referendum, then you know the legislature already approved it. So depending on how you feel about the legislature, that might tell you, oh, okay, yeah, I probably do or I prob probably don't agree with it. So I think that's important to know. If what we're talking about is an initiative, I think it's important to know who got it on the ballot. That's a key question to ask yourself because in order to get all of these signatures in 180 days, somebody paid to do that. Somebody paid the people to stand outside of Target and Walmart and get the signatures. You can't do this with just volunteers. It's, it hasn't been done since the early 80s in California. Somebody paid a lot of money because it's at least a few dollars per signature. So what you want to ask yourself is who paid that money and what's their motive? Just saying. I think those are good questions to ask yourself in deciding how you feel about these propositions. So that is how I think about this and how I, I encourage my students to think about this because it's really important to understand the process here. I'm going to walk you through all the propositions and it's a lot so I know we're going to we're going to be moving fast here to get through them all and if we have time at the end we'll open it up for questions but I want to make sure we get through all of them. Um, I have done research on these I've spent a lot of time digging through them. I can't promise I know everything though because there are 12 of them. And you might still have more questions. So these are sources I can encourage you to go to to look up more information for yourself. My personal favorite and what I probably use the most preparing for this was Voters Edge. This is uh, by the League of Women Voters, nonpartisan. I like it because it puts all the information in one place. Who's for it? Who's against it? What are the arguments? What is the background information you should know? And the main reason why I like it is because it has the financial information. It tells you who is giving to each side of this proposition, who's giving to the yes side and who's giving to the no side. And that is very telling information to probably give you a clue of how you feel about this proposition. So I think Voters Edge is really great 
for looking at information on this. I also really like Cal Matters. They have um, a really good guide on the propositions. And I like it because they talked more about here's the politics behind this. Here's why this ended up on the ballot. Here, here's what the argument is behind the scenes, what interest groups are fighting over this. I think they did a good job of that. You also can always look at the official voter information guide from the Secretary of State. That's, that's uh, information on, from both sides. And the California Legislative Analyst is nonpartisan and does a really good analysis of all the propositions. And so they can be really uh, helpful to look at as well. All right, you ready for this? Here we go, we're gonna, we're gonna dig in. Let's start at the very beginning, Prop 14, really fast. How do they number the propositions? As a question my students always ask. All right, here we go. They number them in order and they restart in November, years, uh, Novembers that end in eight. So November, 2018, we started over back at one and we will just be going in order all the way up to however far we get until November, 2028. So right now we're starting with 14 and we'll keep going. So that's some trivia that my students always ask. Um, so restarts in Novembers of years that end in eight. I'm really fun at parties because I know stuff. Okay, Proposition 14. Um, this is a good example. This time we happen to have a lot of propositions that are repeats of previous propositions or relate to previous propositions. Some of these are gonna sound really familiar, they should. And this is one of those. This one relates to stem cell research. And you can see at the top, uh, each, each uh, proposition, I have the slides formatted in the same way. And this one is an initiative statute. So you know it's an initiative and it's a law. And this, oops, excuse me, I'm sorry. The main idea here is that it authorizes 5.5 billion um, in bonds for stem cell and medical research. So we passed a proposition in 2004, California did, that passed um, about $3 billion in stem cell bonds. And that has gone towards stem cell research and that money's almost gone. Uh, it, it has all been used toward research. And so this is the next iteration of let's issue more bonds. And it keeps the same structure in place. And bonds are just the way the state goes into debt. So the state sells bonds and then pays them back with interest. Uh, it's like a loan. And the total cost to repay the 5.5 billion would be about $7.8 billion over 30 years. That's about normal for bonds. And it would go to um, stem cell medical research. Some of it is designated about 1.5 billion would have to go toward brain diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Um, some of the grants, it's actually interesting. If you start making income, if you have a great discovery and start making money from the research you do with these grants, you actually do, you're required to share some of that income with the state. So the state can make some money back. So far, it has not been anywhere close to how much money the state has paid out, but it can be made, paid back. Um, there's concern over this one for several reasons. One is we are in a recession now and the state is going to be really, really hurting for money in the next few years. And so as a lot of folks are like, as lovely as it is to spend money on this, we don't have the money for this right now. We're gonna be doing well to keep schools open and that sort of thing. We don't have money for this right now. Another issue is that the legislature has no oversight. There's an independent body created to oversee this money and giving out the, the funds for grants and that sort of thing. Um, and the legislature doesn't get to have a say over it and they've gotten in trouble. They had a conflict of interest problem. There have been investigations into them. And this proposition actually would make their oversight board even larger, even though they've already been critiqued for having a board that's too large and doesn't do a good job of oversight. So it's not that folks are opposed for the most part to stem cell research at this point. It's that um, they are troubled by the structure of how this would be done. And they think that probably this should be either its own nonprofit now, or the legislature needs to have more oversight. So there's concern about kind of the structure of how this is done. Um, also, when this was adopted in 2004, the first time, it was because the federal government was not supporting stem cell research. That has changed. So there's federal funding now for stem cell research. So that's another argument that it's not as needed as it was in 2004, because there is federal funding for it now. This does primarily, the UCs, the University of California, is a primary beneficiary. They get a lot of the money for research, along with Stanford, 
um, in some private institutions. But the UCs really want this because it's going to mean a lot of research money for the University of California. So what I have for you on each proposition is I have what three different groups have said. Um, the League of Women Voters, the Democratic Party, and the Republican Party. So this is just the endorsements by the two parties, what they're saying. The League of Women Voters, I really like them. I guess maybe that's another bias. They're nonpartisan. They care about good government. And you're going to see they, um, they take stances that disagree with both parties. So they're not afraid to disagree, which I like about them. And they're neutral on this one. Um, they, they don't take positions on some of the propositions because they don't actually have a policy stance that relates to it. Uh, but on this one, they're neutral. But you can see where the other two parties fall. So uh, that's just some general information. You can look up how other groups feel as well and what they're saying, vote yes, vote no. But I thought these were three of the main ones that I usually look at to see how people are feeling about it. All right, any questions so far? I wanted to check in. It's hard to lecture and not be able to see faces. So I just want to check in and make sure we're okay. Um, it looks like we are. I do want to remind everyone that this is being recorded um, and we will be posting it on the alumni YouTube channel um, later on this week um, as well. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. If you have questions, please do send them to Bill Cole and he's going to help moderate for us um, as we go along. So that's Prop 14, a repeat from 2004. All right, here we go. Another proposition comes back to get us. Proposition 15, it deals with the split role property taxes. So this is an initiative and it's a constitutional amendment. This would actually change the constitution of California. All right, this one gets complicated because it relates back to Proposition 13 of 1978 and that's kind of the granddaddy of propositions. What this would do is it would change property taxes so that commercial property, this does not affect residential or um, farm agriculture property, commercial property worth more than $3 million would be taxed at its current market value. So this is a big deal because this would be changing Proposition 13 of 1978. What Proposition 13 did was property taxes were increasing very quickly in the state and income was not keeping up. And so the voters, that was Prop 13 was an initiative and it limited property taxes. What happens now is when property is sold, the market value at which it's sold is its assessed value. That's what um, it's kind of its worth is on paper. And then from there, the value of the, the property can only go up by at most 2% a year. However, most property in California goes up in value much faster than 2% a year. So it's actually worth a lot more money than what you're paying taxes on. And then you pay at most 1% of the value of your property, the assessed value, you pay at most 1% of that. I know this gets complicated. The thing that's happened is um, when the other thing is when Prop 13 passed, your assessed value was set at a value in the 1970s. And it's not reset to market value unless the prop, at least 50% of the property is sold. And so what businesses have done is they have held on to their properties and they've made sure that they've only at most ever sold 49%. So basically you've got really big businesses still paying taxes on property that's valued at 1970s property values, even though, of course, it's worth far, far more in 2020. So what this would do is if your commercial property is worth more than $3 million on the market, you would be assessed based on the actual market value. No more, it's only capped at 2% a year so that you're, you're, um, you're kind of protected from your property taxes going up by very much it would go up to the market value. Businesses don't like this. You, you might not be surprised to hear this. Um, businesses don't like this. They are not happy. They have been spending money to try to defeat it. And um, there's real concern about, should we be doing this again in the middle of a recession? Is this a change we wanna be making? There's some concern that even though small businesses are protected because they're, you know, it's, it's only if you're worth more than $3 million, 
it would be passed on to small businesses because they rent space from bigger businesses. And so small businesses would potentially be affected as the increase in property taxes is passed on to them. On the other hand, local governments are going to be desperate for money. And this would bring in billions more dollars, particularly for schools, local governments, cities, counties, and schools are hurting for money. And this would come in and really help them. Uh, Prop 13 gets a lot of um, critique for being the reason why we don't spend a lot on public schools in California. What do property taxes go to? Local government, especially schools, and it has really held back the amount of revenue that we have for local government in our state. And so this would be one way it would affect business and it's estimated it would really be the very biggest businesses that would be paying these taxes. Although the concern is, do we do this during a recession? So there's some real pros and cons there. Um, it, it would be a huge change to Prop 13 that's been in place for a long time and is kind of an institution of California government. That would be a really big change. So this is one that I'm really curious to see what happens. Personally, this is the one I'm struggling with the most on how I wanna vote. Um, I'll just say that much. This is the one that I've been thinking about the most of, I'm still not quite sure which way I wanna vote on it. The others I'm pretty sure, but this one I've struggled with the most personally. So I'll just say that much. All right, how's everybody saying to vote? Uh, League of Women Voters, yes. Democratic Party, yes. Republican Party, no. And a lot of this is it needed funding for local government and a reform of Prop 13 that's needed versus we don't need to be raising taxes right now during a recession. That's the really big concern there. Um, so that's why people land where they do on that one. Any questions, Bill? That one's complicated. So I wanna make sure we're okay on that one. I know it's confusing. There is um, one clarifying um, question that um, was, um, is, the, is commercial property, uh, is multifamily property considered commercial property like apartments, duplexes and so on good, and so forth? Really good question. No, that would be residential. That still is zoned for residential. So that, that would not be commercial is my understanding. Yeah, this right. would be like industrial. Perfect. And commercial. And then yeah. um, the $3 million refers to the value of the property, not the value of the business. That's correct? Right. The pro It's the, the property, like the building and the land. Right. Mm -hmm. The building and the land, not the business itself. Yeah. This there's There are more technical details to this one that I'm not going to get into for the sake of time. You can read about it. It, it gets a little bit technical, uh, but that's the, 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 those are the basics of it. Good questions, yeah. Prop 13 gets messy really quickly. It's a tough one to explain in class too, because it's complicated. Okay, Prop 16, this is a hot one. This is, again, a repeat of a previous proposition. Do you see a theme? I think there's a really big theme this year. So this is restoring affirmative action. And you can see this one's different. This one is a legislative constitutional amendment. So this one is coming to us from the legislature. So depending on how you feel about the legislature, that might inform how you feel about this one. This is a repeal of a previous proposition, Proposition 209 passed in 1996. And so the legislature is asking us to undo that previous proposition. What this would do is it would allow consideration of race, sex, color, ethnicity, and national origin in public education, employment, and contracting. So a yes vote on this one would restore affirmative action and a no vote keeps a ban on affirmative action. Currently in California, we are not allowed to have affirmative action other than a few very, very limited situations. But in general, we don't have it. A yes vote would allow affirmative action. When we talk about affirmative action, people tend to get, I think they don't understand what it means or what it is. So. It does not mean quotas. The courts have been very clear. Quotas are not allowed. They are unconstitutional. So it does not mean that a certain number of people who are a certain sex must be hired or admitted to a university. Um, that's not what it means. Affirmative action means a consideration of those factors. So for example, um, this applies to public employment. So any state agency hiring this uh, applies to public contracts. The state of California gives a lot of contracts every year. And this applies to the big one that has gotten a lot of attention for us, universities and public education, higher education. So some examples, 
Um, there could be goals set for how many public contracts are awarded to women owned and minority owned businesses, or it could be a consideration in giving a contract, whether you're giving it to a woman owned or minority owned business. A big one where this has really been the fight, and this was the fight over Prop 209 back in the day, was uh, particularly for the University of California, that race could be a, a factor in admission. This is subtle, but I think it's important to understand what we're talking about here, that um, if these factors are used in admissions, it has to be a holistic process. That when you're looking at the whole of an applicant's application, this is one piece of it, but you've got to take in the whole picture. So it's not quotas or anything like that. It's one piece of all the information. And this is important for a few reasons. The courts do allow this. And um, I think it's important to understand why. One is that when we're talking about education, part of education is being exposed to diverse points of view and diverse perspectives. And so you, you want to have a diverse student body as part of the educational process in and of itself. And that's actually the argument the courts have really almost liked or preferred is that part of the educational process is hearing from diverse students. And so you need to have a diverse student body. And so this would be part of the um, one part of the consideration. The other issue is we know that we do still have issues of systemic racism, systemic sexism. All you have to do is look at something like SAT scores and you, we know that um, it advantages some groups over others. And so if what your basing admissions decisions are, what your basing admissions decisions on are factors like SAT scores that we know are biased, you need to take other factors into consideration to overcome some of that bias. And so there's a reason for a more holistic uh, view of applicants because we know that some of these metrics we use are actually already biased. So we need to take other factors into consideration. So that's why there's a really big push from some groups for passing Prop 16. Um, there's concern against it. Uh, those who are saying vote no, because um, there's a concern that any consideration of these issues is in and of itself discrimination. If we don't want to discriminate, don't use race as a factor. Don't use sex. Don't use ethnicity, those sorts of things. And so that's the other side of the argument is don't discriminate, don't use these factors. And so that's the other side. Um, I'm really curious to see how this plays out. This is on the ballot because of the Black Lives Matter movement, because of the, um, that that was so big over the summer, the legislature wanted to give attention to these important issues of race. And um, that's why they put it on the ballot. That's why it's there. So I'm curious to see what the state does with that. This is how groups are saying to vote. The League of Women Voters is yes, Democratic Party, yes. Republican Party, no. And so that's how the different groups are endor or suggesting that you vote on it. Any questions there? Affirmative action is a tough one. Yeah, it, um, thank you, um, Dr. Hill. Um, um, we had one um, uh, person comment that um, if you would, um, and thank you for doing it on that previous slide, but point out um, when propositions are, are written backwards, like a yes vote really means ne you know negate it. You did a good job on this yeah. slide, but uh, but uh, it was just um, just making sure that you let us know what the vote means on that as well. Thank um, you for that. Yeah, I'll try to do that. And some of them, I know that's one of the biggest critiques of this is it gets really confusing. So wait, is a yes yeah. a no? And yeah, yeah, I know it gets confusing. So that's what this one means. Thanks. And, then, and, and if, then, I, if it ends up being confusing, please let me know. Will do. And then one other qu clarifying question that came in is what's the difference between a quota uh, per se and then setting goals um, with public contracts? That's a good, good question. So a quota would mean that I'm going to make this up on numbers. If we have 100 um, contracts, 50 of those must go to women. They will. That will that they will go to women versus we're going to work toward 50 and the way the way you do that with affirmative action so you might have a goal of 50% will go to women but what we're going to do is really get out we're going to reach out to women's groups and really encourage them to apply we're going to have mentoring by women who have we're going to we're going to have a program where women who have already received contracts can mentor women who are applying for contracts so it would be making lots of efforts and spending some time and money on making those efforts to improve numbers versus 50% will go to women. 
and then that's that's what happens is 50% go to women um, that you set a number versus working toward that goal. Does that make I, hopefully that distinction makes sense. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right. So Proposition 17. This is parolee voting rights. This one is also coming to us um, from the legislature. It's a legislative constitutional amendment. And this would allow people on parole to vote. Currently in California, if you are um, on parole, so you have served a prison sentence and you are finishing the rest of your sentence on parole, you are not eligible to vote. You have to finish your parole, then you can vote. This would allow people who are on parole to vote. And so a yes is people on parole can vote, a no is they can't. Um, so you would be allowed to register to vote. This is an interesting topic because the states are really different in terms of what they allow. There are some states, just a few, but there are some where you're in prison, we will just send you an absentee ballot, you, you still have full voting rights. Other states, once you are convicted of a felony, you lose voting rights for the rest of your life. So the states are like all over the place in terms of what they allow. This is kind of middle ground. Um, there are other states that already allow this. And um, the arguments for it is that it would encourage reentry into society and community that if, if someone um, is released to parole and you get them engaged and help them feel like they're part of the community and society, you're actually improving their chances for doing well and for um, not going back to prison. You actually are improving their life and the lives of those that they interact with because um, it improves the uh, recidivism rates. You see recidivism drop. The concern is that um, if you're on parole, you have not fully proven your rehabilitation and should we fully restore your rights before we have seen full evidence of rehabilitation. So that's the concern there. Um, the League of Women Voters and Democratic Party both say yes, and the Republican Party says no. So that's that's where they land. Um, this is an interesting one, given how the states are so different. I find that fascinating, and it'll be interesting to see what the people of California do with this one. Um, this has been a hot topic. Who should be allowed to vote? It's uh, We've seen a lot on voting rights in general in our country and how important that is, and so it'll be interesting to see what people do with this one. Any questions there? No, none at all right now. On this okay. one. Thank you. This one's a little more straightforward. Some of the others are a little more complicated. This one, pretty straightforward in terms of what it would do. Great. Another voting one also coming to us from the legislature, a legislative constitutional amendment. This would let 17 year olds vote in a primary or special election if they are um, 18 by the time of the general election. So a yes vote would let 17 year olds vote if they will be 18 by the time of the general election. So we have our primaries early in March or June, um, and then we have the general election in November. So if you're someone who your birthday falls in between, this would let you vote at in the primary as long as you're gonna be 18 by the general election. It would also let you run uh, for office at most, it would cost a million dollars per election cycle just to do the paperwork and to have some more voting happening. I was not aware of this, but actually this is already allowed in about half the states. I didn't know that until I researched this. So this is not uncommon. And we already in California allow for pre-registration. 16 and 17 year olds can pre-register to vote so that as soon as they turn 18, they're good to go. They're ready to vote. So we've been encouraging that. And this would um, encourage that early participation even more. And the whole point is to encourage uh, civic engagement for young people. Uh, uh, if you get them hooked early, get them voting, they're more likely to be engaged for the rest of their lives. And the main concern not to do this is because you're still not talking about legal adults. You are talking about 17 year olds. So there's some concern that you need to be a legal adult in order to vote. So that would be one of the main concerns there. Um, League of Women Voters, yes. Democratic Party, yes. Republican Party, no. Um, this is going to start to look different for some of the other propositions, but we've had several in a row that looks like this, but it'll look different in a little bit. But this one, again, is pretty straightforward. A yes would let the 17-year-olds vote in the primary or special election 
as long as they're 18 by that November election day. So that one is pretty straightforward. But any questions on any of those? Okay. No, 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 not, nothing clarifying for that. Thank you. Great, thanks. All right, this next one might be a little bit more confusing. Proposition 19 is property taxes for seniors. This is also coming to us from the legislature. This is a repeat. This might seem familiar because we did vote on something a lot like this, uh, I think in 2018, and that did not pass. It went down. So they're coming back with something very similar. Um, this is, if you're a homeowner who's over 55 and you move, you can transfer that tax base to a new residence. So back when we were talking about Prop 13, that um, you pay taxes based on the assessed value for when you bought the house. So what this can actually do is it can discourage people who've lived in a home for a long time from moving. And it can actually discourage folks who are over 55 from downsizing because it's possible to go from a big house but the, the taxes you were paying were low because they're based on something from 20 or 30 years ago. And you might move to a smaller house and your property taxes will actually go up because they're based on the price you just paid for your new smaller house that you downsized to. And we don't wanna do that. We don't wanna, um, this is really focused on seniors. We don't want seniors to be stuck and not able to move. That's actually not good for the housing market. It's not good for them. So they can one time transfer the lower assessed value from their old home to their new home. You can do that. You can do that. Um, this also would apply to people who are disabled or who are affected by natural disaster. So currently, there are a few counties that have this policy in place that if you're over 55 or you have a severe disability, you can do this transfer one time and it's to protect seniors who are downsizing. Okay. And a key point is you have to move to a home that's of lesser value than the one you just sold. So you have to be downsizing. This would allow for you to do that up to three times. You could do this across the state. So right now it's only a few counties that kind of have an agreement that allow you to do this. This would be anywhere in the state. You can do this up to three times and you can actually buy a house worth more money and keep the assessed value from your past home. Um, realtors want this. This is, this is the realtors really got the legislature going and got the, the legislature to put this on the ballot. But they knew that um, this might not go over well. So it also gets rid of a tax break that Prop 13 has where if you inherit, inherit a house from your parents, um, you don't get a tax break on it. You don't get to keep the old assessed value as an inherited house unless it's your primary residence. But if it's just now a second home and you're renting it out or something, you lose the tax break. So it's a way to offset um, what this would do because this would lose some property taxes from seniors moving, getting rid of that inheritance loophole would raise the taxes back up. So overall property taxes actually would probably be higher, tens of millions of dollars per year, but kind of more or less offsets the whole thing. But this is really, the realtors want this because it would be good for the real estate market. Um, this is one where you get something different. The League of Women Voters says no, the Democratic Party says yes, and the Republican Party didn't take a position. I think because it's kind of playing this game with taxes, some are going up, some are going down. I think Republicans are like, mm, don't know that we really wanna play that game. So they didn't take a position. Um, but this, the other two groups actually disagree on this one. So this is interesting. It's again, a change to property taxes on the ballot did not pass last time. And so that closing the loophole on the inheritance property tax that was added this time to make it a little sweeter. And they're hoping that's what will get it to pass this time is that um, they've kind of closed the loophole so that the, the taxes will balance out. And that's, that's what they did this time. So kind of an interesting one when these are coming back to us again. I know that's complicated. So any questions there, Bill? Um, I think you answered one. One was that um, doesn't this provision already exist? And to a certain extent it did one time you mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but this and only a that. few counties. So it did one time, only a few counties and you have to move to a smaller house. Now gotcha. it's everywhere, 
three times and you can actually move to a bigger house. And um, just for clarification, a yes vote on this prop a proposition would do what? A yes vote, thank you, um, would change it to this new rule where seniors, those over 55, could move up to three times anywhere in the state and uh, keep the assessed value on their own pro old property, even if the house is the new house is worth more. So it would change and give them even more flexibility in keeping that old assessed value. And that's what a yes vote would do. A no vote just leaves everything the same. It doesn't make any changes. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Thank you. I'm looking at my notes. I have a lot of notes here because it's a lot of details on all of these. So I want to make sure I'm not missing um, anything else important. But that loophole was the big change from last time so that people would feel better about it. Okay. Proposition 20. This increases criminal penalty. This, I'm sorry, this is an initiative statute. So this is coming at us as an initiative. And this increases criminal penalties for some property crimes and parole violations, makes it more difficult to qualify for parole, and it would uh, require DNA collection of adults convicted of some misdemeanors. This one's kind of complicated in exactly everything it does, but it increases criminal penalties. Um, if it, it's, it, it's a lot of details about exactly what it does for different penalties, but the main idea is that in recent years, California has made a lot of criminal justice reforms. We made a lot of changes. Some of that we had to make. We were actually under federal court order to decrease the size of our prisons because they were so overcrowded, they were actually inhumane. So we had to make changes to decrease the size of uh, the population of our prisons. And we have um, kind of eased up on some things just because it was getting too expensive for us to keep uh, criminalizing so many offenses and we we couldn't afford it and the feds told us you have to do something you can't have inhumane prisons um, so we reduced the prison population we also improved equity we know also that in our criminal justice system um, it tends to really disadvantage folks who are already disadvantaged anyone who is coming from a lower income and a lot of population groups are really hurt by our prison system so we wanted to improve equity so the argument behind this initiative is that the reforms have gone too far and we need to pull them back a bit um, because it has um, it, it's gone too far. We've eased up too much on some of this uh, these criminal behavior. And so we need to do something to um, roll that back. This would increase our costs. Um, putting people having more people in prison is very expensive. And so this would increase the costs for state and local governments. Um, this really, I'm going to tell you the politics behind it. It really is the police and prison unions that got this on the ballot and that are pushing for it. Um, it it's the unions, the, the police and prison guard unions that really want this and that have paid for it and that are pushing for it. Um, if you look, uh, the League of Women Voters and Democratic Party are no, the Republican Party is yes. And the concern is just that we have made good progress. It's not perfect. There's still a lot of room to be made in terms of how we handle these issues, but that we've, we've made progress in terms of equity and um, improving our system. And we don't want to roll back those changes. That's the concern. And um, yeah, it is pretty clear kind of the politics behind this one. I think this actually is the one that made Jerry Brown really mad. Uh, because this is trying to undo some of the reforms that he pushed when he was governor. So he is not uh, happy about this one because it's trying to undo. Yeah, Jerry Brown is pretty mad. Also, Facebook is against this one. Um, so that's kind of interesting. But that's the, um, that's the idea of folks are like, no, we need to keep working in the direction of the reforms we've already made, not undoing them. So that's the idea there. So a yes vote would roll back the reforms and increase criminal penalties. A no vote would just leave, leave us where we currently are and leave us with the, the um, policies we have in place that have already made changes and reduce our prison population. Okay. 
rent control. This is also a repeat. There are a lot of repeats this time. Um, this is an initiative statute. And this would allow local government to, to impl uh, implement rent control on residential properties over 15 years old. So this would be counties and cities could have some rent control on residential properties over 15 years old. So anything new, no, but older properties, yes. Um, currently, state law does not allow local governments to have their own rent control on housing built after February 1st, 1995. Now this year, um, California did pass a state law that implemented some rent control. Um, let's see, I have that here in my notes. Um, there's uh, a cap on annual rent increases at about 8%. So the state did something this year that annual rent increases can't be more than 8%. This would allow for even more controls to be put in place at the local level. Um, because currently they're not allowed to do that. It would also limit rent increases for new renters. So if you are moving in to a property for the, and you're a brand new renter, it would protect you from the price being um, jacked up over what the previous renter was paying. This would cause um, a loss of property tax revenue. So it, uh, properties would be somewhat devalued and that would mean a loss in property tax revenue. And the main reason for this is just because housing is so expensive in California. Um, that's the main argument for it is that housing is really expensive and so we need to do something about it. This would give local governments the chance to do something about it. The arguments against are that um, the state is already trying something, they've put something in place and if local governments start messing with it, rent control can have some strange consequences it can um, make it can mess with the market it can make it harder to find a place to rent it can hurt property values so there's concern about doing this at the local level this one is interesting because the league of women voters did not take a position on it they don't really take a stance on this issue the democratic party says yes the republicans party says no but gavin newsom the democratic governor actually says no he actually disagrees with the party here which is Think is really interesting. He thinks the state is trying something, so let them try their um, policy that they have in place already and we'll see where it goes. So he's actually going against the party on this one uh, because it hurts the housing market, creates shortages, and also there's concern we need housing built. And if there's rent control, it would discourage building new housing, which is actually what we need to meet the demand for housing is you need more supply. Um, so he came out against it. So that one's pretty interesting. Uh, but businesses and property owners are the ones who are against this because it would mean revenue loss for them. So that's where that's where they come down. Any questions at this point? Just want to check in. Yes, um, there was. Um, I have two. Um, one is just to repeat um, what that something the state is currently trying to do in yes. um, um, on that because you mentioned about um, uh, capping it at eight percent and such. Yeah, so last year, the state legislature passed a law, Gavin Newsom signed it, or did Jerry Brown, one of them signed it. Uh, but so it's a state law, very new, that um, there, there is a cap. There's already rent control in place. There's a cap on annual rent increases at about 8%. So the, already there's a control in place that your rent should not go up by more than 8% from year to year. And so the state's already trying to do something, that 8% cap and um, they kind of want to let that work before letting local governments come in and maybe do something different. There's a lot of concern about that. So your rent should not go up by more than 8% a year. The other question, clarify, to, just to clarify, would, would this allow municipalities to go beyond that though with, with rent control that they could actually raise it beyond what the state is, is trying to mandate? Exactly. So what they could do is it could be your city comes in and says, we want to cap it at 5% a year. So they could be even stricter. That's what it would allow is that local government cities or counties could be even stricter and say, your rent cannot go up by more than 5% a year, something like that. So that's what it would let them do. And so mm -hmm. if you say yes, it would give your city or county the choice of having even tighter rent controls in place. They might, they don't have to adopt it. Mm -hmm. So there are certainly a lot of places that would not adopt it, but it would at least be an option for them. The, I'm sorry, I, I misrepresented the question. Could they actually go above the 8%? No, they, 
No, I, if that's, that's a good question. I don't believe so. I think if it's at 8%, like that's kind of, that's the max they could only, my understanding is they could only be even stricter because otherwise there's not really a point. Yeah, good question. Okay. Just a sec, could I sit with that? Sorry, sorry, Bill. Oh no, I'm uh, my internet may be giving out. I'm sorry. So oh no, uh, okay. No, you're good. Please okay. go on to the Thanks. next one. All right, this next one is probably the one you've seen the most commercials for, and that's because they've spent almost two hundred million dollars to have all those commercials on TV. Um, that's I know definitely the one I've been seeing the most. So this is an initiative statute, and this is. Um, how this is basically Uber and Lyft are the main ones that you've seen, but also DoorDash, Instacart, their drivers. So for these apps, their drivers, how are they classified? If you vote yes on this prop, then the app-based drivers, the Uber and Lyft drivers would be independent contractors. A no vote means the app-based drivers would be employees. What's the difference? benefits. Employees get more benefits. Independent contractors get less benefits. Uber, Lyft, DoorDash have spent almost $200 million um, trying to get you to vote yes so that they're independent contractors so that they don't get as many benefits. All right, so we recently, California recently passed a law, the legislature passed a law that says that these app drivers, ride share and delivery companies, um, that they're employees of these companies and other gig workers, that these are actually employees. They're not independent contractors. And the difference again is if you're an employee, that means you get benefits like healthcare and overtime and things like that. If you're an independent contractor, you don't get those benefits. And there was a lot of concern about these drivers and how are they being protected? Um, we're seeing this especially now because of the pandemic. How are they being protected? Do they get paid time off? Do they get unemployment? Do they get all those kinds of benefits? Um, this law was passed before the pandemic, but it's become even more relevant because of it. And so the state said, no, these folks need to be classified as employees. But Uber and Lyft don't like that because it costs them a lot of money to give all of these drivers benefits. So they put this on the ballot to undo that, pre that law and make them independent contractors again. So a yes would make them independent contractors. Um, employees, they get minimum wage, overtime, healthcare, paid sick leave, those sorts of benefits. Now, this, this does include a compromise that if, they're, if it passes and they, they're independent contractors, they would still get a few benefits, like they would get um, subsidies toward healthcare. So it's not that they wouldn't get healthcare, but they'd get some subsidies toward it. Um, what were some of the other benefits? Min at least 120% of minimum wage, accident insurance, healthcare subsidies. So they get a little bit of benefits, but not uh, what they get if they're full employees getting those full employee benefits. So that's what this fight is over. And that's why um, Uber and Lyft have paid so much money for all of those commercials to get you to vote yes, so that they're independent contractors. And they're the ones who paid to get this on the ballot. So that's why I say when you really want to track how this got on the ballot and who paid to put it here, this is why. So the League of Women Voters does not have a position on this one. The Democratic Party says no, the Republican Party says vote yes. And it's that independent contractor versus employee thing that's the difference here. How do we feel, or how, how do we do with that one? I know that's complicated. I think Are you we did okay? very well. But, oh, thank you. Uh, but there is uh, one uh, very good question, I think, is th does this pertain only to um, app-based drivers or does it to all independent contractors in other sectors as well? So it's not all, but it's a lot of gig workers. So this, that's what gets technical and it, it's definitely being driven by those app drivers. There's kind of a, there's a, it gets technical. There's a three prong test for, are you an employee versus a contractor? It gets really messy, but it does apply to some other gig workers as well. You might want to look at the details of it. Um, and I'll, I should say this too, the, um, the bill that made these drivers employees that 
Uber and Lyft are trying to undo. It's AB5, Assembly Bill 5. It is That bill is heavily critiqued. And even the Democratic Party that's saying vote no on this, they agree AB5 needs to be fixed. So the legislature does want to go back and fix it. Um, not as extreme as what this would do, but they agree it's problematic and they want to fix it. They just need some time to fix it. And remember, if if we vote yes on this and it passes, the legislature can't fix it, right? It's out of their hands then. So um, it, it's not a perfect bill and the, they admit that people are unhappy with it and it needs to be fixed. They just think, give the legislature time. That the argument is give the legislature time to fix it. Don't do it this way because then they can't fix it at all. So that's the argument there. Good. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, good question. All right, Prop 23, you might have also seen a lot of commercials for this one. I know I have, and it might sound familiar because this is also a repeat of a proposition from two years ago. This is what we do in California, people. This is not how you make policy. I don't, yeah, but that's just me. I'm just a professional political scientist. What do I know? Okay, so um, this is an initiative statute. And um, what this would do is increase a yes vote would increase regulation of dialysis clinics. Um, one of the main things it would do would require the presence of a doctor during any treatment. So dialysis clinics currently are very regulated and they do have to be supervised by a doctor, but the doctor doesn't actually have to be there while treatment is happening. So um, if someone who, someone who needs dialysis, usually you go three times a week for four hours at a time for dialysis because your, your kidneys are not operating like you, they need to. Um, and so you need dialysis to remove toxins from your body. And um, so it's very time intensive, it's very expensive, but, and you are um, under a doctor's care and supervision, but they don't actually have to be there present at the moment. This would require a doctor to actually be there and require increased regulation of these clinics. Um, the clinics would need permission from the state health department before closing or reducing services. They could not discriminate against patients based on insurance or how they pay. The main concern here is that this would really drive up clinics costs and potentially close some of the dialysis clinics and it would increase the cost. Um, it would increase the cost for government. Government through um, Medicaid and Medicare pays for a lot of this. And so it increased the cost to government as the costs for the clinics would increase. This one is one where you wanna look at what's going on behind the scenes. This was put on the ballot um, by unions. Uh, the SEIU wants to unionize these dialysis clinics and the clinics have fought them. So there are two main private uh, for-profit dialysis big, big uh, companies that run these dialysis clinics. There are other small ones, but there are two main companies two big ones that run this in California and they have fought unionization of their employees and the unions are mad at them. And so the union keeps putting this on the ballot to try to get back at them, to force them to unionize. That's, this is about unions versus the big uh, for-profit dialysis companies. So the League of Women Voters doesn't have a stance on this, but the Democratic Party says yes. And the Republican Party says no, this is really unions versus the big for-profit dialysis clinics. The dialysis clinics are spending uh, about, so far about $95 million on fighting this one to get you to vote no. So a no leaves regulation just like it is right now. A yes vote would increase the regulation of the clinics. So you'd have to have a doctor and those sorts of things, but it's really that battle between dialysis businesses and unions. Um, so they already have to meet standards. They're already overseen by the California Department Department of Public Health. So it's not like they're unregulated now. This would just mean even higher standards for them. And actually, we don't even know if there are enough doctors for them to be able to do this. So that's actually a concern um, is that we don't even know if there are enough doctors. So there, there are some concerns about this one and it's important to know the politics behind it, I would say. Any questions there? Okay, I'm gonna keep going. Proposition 24 is consumer privacy laws. This is an initiative statute. This one is super complicated. And I'm just gonna say that should be a red flag to you. Again, 
if it's super complicated and no one's quite sure what it's going to do and then we're stuck with it once it passes i have a few questions personally i'm just going to say um, so this would allow consumers to prevent businesses from sharing personal information limits use of personal information um, in some ways this makes our privacy laws in the state even stricter and in other ways it makes them less strict so it it's, it's being sold as something that makes our privacy laws stricter, but it actually does some things that people who care about privacy laws are like, mm, you're actually loosening up the restrictions. So it does a little bit of both. That's why I'm saying this one's really complicated, really hard to follow. People who follow consumer privacy laws are torn over this. They're like, well, there's some parts that are good and some parts that are bad. And it's really hard to get a consensus. Um, so we do have a pretty recent state law in California that lets consumers find out what data is collected about them and tell businesses not to sell data. So the state is already active in this policy area. This would increase our power over some of our personal data. So like you'd have um, even more, you could potentially have more restrictions on your data that companies can. So this is if you're online and you're, you're giving companies information, how much can you restrict what they do with their data? It would create a state agency to enforce these laws. One thing that's really concerning to a lot of folks is that if you tell a business that you they can't sell your data, so I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna buy something from you, but you're not allowed to sell my information, they could actually charge you more. That concerns a lot of people that it would let it would let businesses discriminate based on whether or not you're willing to let them sell your data. This is really complicated. I tried to make good sense of it, but when I read that the experts are confused, I did not feel bad when I was confused. Um, so it's complicated. It, it has some greater restrictions. It includes rollbacks to existing protections. So if you vote yes, it allows for some um, greater restrictions of your personal information. If you vote no, it leaves the current law in place which already California is kind of a leader in restricting your personal information. Um, and there's, there's a, this was a tough one to, um, to figure out what's going on. Um, it allows consumers to request that businesses not share sensitive information, but it also makes it harder for consumers to restrict their information because you would have to fill out paperwork for each website. So it gets really complicated is this good? Is this bad? And people tend to be really torn on this one. Um, the League of Women Voters says no. The Democratic Party is neutral and the Republican Party says no. So I think folks are concerned that this is not clear and it has some good parts, some bad parts, and they're just not comfortable with it as a whole package is what I would say. I know that wasn't super clear because it's not super clear. I tried. Okay. Are we Sarah, good? I'm sorry. No, no we are good. Um, okay. there, are, there are a few questions, but they're not sure. necessarily clarifying. But since it looks like we're going to have time um, okay. at the end, um, I'll come back to them as well. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. Then, okay. You're so strong. You've made it to the last one. Look how strong you are. You've done a good job. Okay. So this last one, um, this is the protest referendum on the ballot. So this is the only one we have this time that we don't do them a lot, but this is one the legislature passed. Remember a protest referendum. The legislature passed it and normally it would just become a law there normally there would not be a vote but the bail bond companies hate this one because it will put them out of business so they got signatures to put it on the ballot and require a vote of the people so um this is so it's a law that already passed the legislature and if you vote yes so i have this in this one because i know this gets confusing yes lets this new law go into effect a no would stop it. And the new law kind of gets rid of cash bail. That's the idea is we're gonna get rid of cash bail. This was a bill that was signed into effect by Governor Brown in 2018. Um, and what would happen is if someone is um, accused of a crime, they're arrested, instead of having to pay cash bail, each, each uh, county court system would come up with a, an assessment mechanism an algorithm to look at the person and determine how much of a risk are you? Will you 
reoffend? Will you commit another crime? If we release you, will you commit another crime? Will you um, report back to court? When we have you come back for your trial, will you report back to court? If you're low risk, you would be released. You would not have to pay bail. If you're medium risk, it would kind of be up to the judge to decide. If you're high risk, you're going to stay in jail. So it's getting rid of cash bail and instead using some sort of an assessment of how risky are you to decide, can we release you and you'll come back on your court date or do we need to keep you? So a yes law would let this go into effect as it was passed by the legislature. A no bail would, a no vote would stop it and we would keep our current bail system. The bail industry is against this. They have paid lots of money. Um, to stop it, they got it on the ballot because it will essentially put them out of business. Because uh, they issue, they that's how a lot of people uh, pay bail is through bail bond companies. The reason why the state adopted this is because we know cash bail is classist and racist. That people who are already hurting for money cannot afford bail. They can't even afford the ten percent that you have to pay a bail bond company for them to get you out. And so you end up staying in jail and it only hurts you because you're, it, and it hurts your community, it hurts your family. You're not working, you're not paying your rent, you lose your house, it hurts your family. It's actually the system of bail um, is very classist and hurts people who are already economically disadvantaged. And so there's been a lot of critique that we really need to reform the system, not just in California, across the United States. Governments have been looking at their system of bail because we know it's highly problematic and so they've been looking at getting rid of bail. And this was California's attempt to do that, to get rid of the bail system. Um, now, the concern is we, each county has to create a risk assessment, an algorithm to determine how risky someone is. And there's a lot of concern about how will they do that? Because will that just end up being a racist classist system also that dis, uh, you know, disadvantages people who are already disadvantaged and keeps them in jail for even longer. So there's concern about it. Judges will still have discretion. Ultimately, the judge has the final say. They will look at your risk assessment and have a sense of how risky are you, but um, they have the ultimate say. So there's still discretion from the judge and there's concern about, is this just sort of replicating the problem? But the hope is that it's at least a step in the right direction, although, um, there's concern that we need to keep this bail system. The other thing is, um, so there would be automatic release for most misdemeanor crimes. So if it's just a misdemeanor, you would be released except for a domestic violence charge or if you failed to appear in court more than two times in the last year. So if they're really concerned about you, if it's a domestic violence charge, you stay. Um, and then for a felony charge, they would go through this risk assessment process. So it, it's, the goal is to decrease bail because we know it's very problematic and it hurts communities and keeping you in prison, keeping you in jail because you can't afford bail just means you're not working and you definitely still can't afford it. And now you can't pay rent and your family is hurting the whole thing. It's, it's reproducing this really um, troubled system. So the League of Women Voters says yes to let the law go into effect that gets rid of cash bail. Democratic Party says yes. The Republican Party says no. So a no vote would keep the old cash bail system. And that's the vote there. Whew. And those are the 12 propositions on the ballot. No problem. It's wow. easy. You've yeah, got the, this. You've got this. They're straightforward, um, obviously, totally. as well. Totally. Um, I do have um, a couple of clarifying ones on this. Yes. And, then, and then another one we'll come back to as well. Um, one clarifying question is, what do we currently use instead of cash bail? Um, so right now it's still a cash bail. Yeah. Right now it's still a cash bail system. So that is the system in place. Um, this law is on hold. As, as a pro Once a protest referendum is on the ballot, um, implementing the law is on hold. And so we're waiting to see the outcome. But right now that cash bail system is still in place. So if you're, if you're in, um, if you're arrested, you're in jail and the judge says, you know, you need to pay, you need to pay bail you have to come up with the money or else you stay in jail. Or you can give 10% to a bail bond company and they put up the rest of the money and guarantee that you'll show up on your court date. But for folks who are economically disadvantaged, even putting up 10% can be a real hardship. Um, 
I saw a question about Lyft and Uber, and this, this was a good point. I should have said this, I'm sorry. With Lyft and Uber, um, they're saying that if, if um, their drivers are employees, that they're threatening to leave, or I don't think they'll leave because there's still money to be made. But what they'll do is the prices of Uber and Lyft rides will go up tremendously and they will have to let go of some of their drivers. So the threat is that the, their prices will go up and they'll, they'll um, get rid of drivers. If we vote no, yeah, it would give the legislature time. To, I don't think Uber and Lyft are going anywhere. California is a huge market. They would go back to the legislature and work out a compromise with the legislature is what would happen because the legislature has already said they know the current law, AB5, needs reform. Nobody's, like, everybody knows that. That's, that's well known. So they would go back and work on reforming what's in place and coming up with a compromise because we already know that's what they're talking about with AB5. Great. So good and, questions. Oh, there's some great questions here um, good. Um, as well. Um, um, we're going back to Prop 19 for this one. Uh-huh. Prop um, 19, okay. Prop 19. Um, would uh, the, and the uh, the question is would they have to keep the new house as the private primary residence meaning they couldn't move and rent out the old house oh that's a good one yeah you'd have to you'd have to actually sell the old house to get to get the assessed value of the old house on the new house you have to sell the old house okay. that's a good one so you can't keep the old one and rent it and then buy a new one you have to sell the old to transport the assessed value to the new one so it has to, there has to actually be a sale. That's a good question. Yeah. Perfect. Um, now we're going to Prop 22. Um, you right. answered um, a couple of those, but one um, uh, question is, is, is one of the consequences that they might limit the hours, the amount of hours that people would work um, um, as their employee if it passes so that they would not um, um, have, have access to certain benefits? Yeah, they, I, that's a really good question. I think they probably would, especially overtime. They're not going to want to pay overtime. So they would probably schedule employees. Uh, so this is the Uber and Lyft one. They would probably schedule their employees and ensure that nobody's getting overtime. And yeah, they would probably do some things to keep them as part-time employees instead of full-time and, and those sorts of things. Um, they probably would be strategic in terms of how they... Um, schedule their employees yeah and and they would also probably get rid of some employees um if yeah they would probably get rid of some of their employees also yeah great thank you um sarah um for on prop 23 mm -hmm. um that's the, the dialysis uh, dialysis one, one. Um, the question is what poor regulations are in place that would require increase regulations Okay, what's in place? So I've got my notes here. Let me go to my notes. And, so, and, and, um, why, and why would a doctor have to be present? Right, so there's not really a need for a doctor to be present. That's, they're trying to get it. It's the union's trying to get at the dialysis clinics. There's That's not right. a need for a doctor to be present. There is a need for patients to be under a doctor's care. If you're getting dialysis, uh, you are ill. And so it is important you're under a doctor's care. It's not necessary for them to actually be there. Um, so let's see. Um, I'm looking at my notes to see if I had, that was the main one I saw. I don't have more in my notes, um, but that's the main one is requiring a doctor to be there. And there aren't enough doctors for that. So that's a real concern. Um, and they are licensed. They have to, you know, you have to follow um, you, their inspections and you have to be cleanly and, you know, all of those sorts mm -hmm. of things. Like you have to follow the proper medical procedures. All of those things are in place. Um, but to re it's the main one I saw is requiring the doctor to be there. Um, Great. Thank yeah. you. Professor Hill. I think you'd have um, to dig in. You you could dig in some more to the details of exactly what else it would require, but that's the one people are freaking out over. In the in Prop 24, um, consumer privacy, um, the question is, um, who's financially backing the initiative? Yeah. Okay. So that's really interesting. Prop 24 is consumer privacy. It's one dude. It's one dude, and he does strange things. Um, it is Michael Weinstein. 
Is that the one? Um, no, 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 no. I, I misspoke. I misspoke. I'm sorry. It's one guy and he is, I don't have his name here. I'm so sorry. Um, it's one dude and he, it's his pet project. It's just like, he really cares about consumer privacy. And so he wrote a, this is the way the, the proposition works. He wrote a law, he wanted it on the ballot. And so he got it there. Um, so the yes side, it has about five, over $5 million in favor of it. And I think it's one rich man who this is what he wants, but um, there's not a broad coalition of privacy advocates behind him. And some of them actually disagree with him and are saying vote no. So the community that cares about um, consumer privacy laws, they're not all behind this. They're kind of torn on it. Or like I said, I, I have the sense they like some parts of it and really dislike other parts. So as a whole, there's not a lot of consensus, but it's one advocate. I, I don't remember his name. I'm sorry, because I don't know what else he does, but consumer privacy. <laughs> and um, this is his pet project. It's what he loves. He's willing to put up the money for it. And, and that's the way the initiative system works. If you have millions of dollars, you can get, if you are willing to pay for it, you can get anything you want on the ballot and force a vote on it. It does not mean it's a good policy. There's no check on, is it good policy other than the people vote on it eventually, but he, he's passionate and he got it on the ballot. Thank you. Yes, um, Alistair McTaggart. Thank you. San, Fran San Francisco real estate developer, Alistair McTag McTaggart. Somebody sent it to me. Yeah, he's, just Mr. Prop 24. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Um, prop, uh, oh, I'm still on Prop 24. Okay. Um, uh, why would businesses be allowed to charge more if we don't let them sell our data? Because this prop says they can. <laughs> that's it. If we write the law, that's the mm -hmm. law. And this prop that's says true. they can. Yeah, this prop says they can. I'm suspicious of that too. I will say that. Yeah. It's because the prop says they can. That's how it works. Great. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for a couple more here. Sure. Um, um, prop 25, <laughs> um, could you discuss the NAACP's opposition um, to that law? OK, so Prop 25 is the referendum on replacing bail. I am, I'll have to be honest, I'm not familiar with their precise opposition, the NAACP. My guess is what I've heard. Uh, is that the concern is that if we are using these risk assessment algorithms to evaluate whether or not someone is a flight risk basically so if we let you out on if we let you out without you know there's no bail but we let you out um will you either commit a crime again will you reoffend, or not appear for your court date you know so we're going to have you back for a trial or whatever will you show up and there's concern that it would that would be racist that if we are assessing people's level of risk um, and actually also still leaving it to the discretion of judges, ultimately the judge will have the say on whether or not you are released, that that could still be a racist system. We don't know how these algorithms will be created. Who It's not really clear exactly how this will work. Um, the, the exact implementation of it is still unknown. And so there's a lot of concern about will the, the risk assessment itself repeat the problem that we have with bail and we don't know um so that i my guess is that's the naacp's concern that's a concern i've heard that would i think align with what that's their concerns are the profile against wow interesting thank you um thank you um sarah um, mm -hmm. um I w it was just pointed out to me that um in the um the uh, voting guide itself and i believe it's the no argument there is a section um, where the NAACP goes into a little bit more detail um, mm -hmm. on that as well. So please do read your um, um, uh, information that comes to you. Still, I'm st sticking with, it looks like we got time for a couple more. Um, on, still on 25, would voting yes on this require any future, potential future adjustments to SB 10? Which one is S is SB 10 the bill that passed this? I'm gonna I don't remember all the numbers, y'all. I'm okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna um, guess SB 10 is the the so that would be Senate Bill 10. So that's mm -hmm. what the legislature, the bill yeah. the legislature passed to um pass this law to replace bail, mm -hmm. right? Replace cash bail, and we get to vote on this. Um it might. If the if it turns out these risk assessments are not working, it might require more adjustment in the future. That's how policy works though. 
policy changes over time. As we learn more and we learn what's working and not working, we adjust it. And so it definitely could require change in the future if we realize, oh, we need more regulations on these assessments and how they work. We need to make sure they're working properly. Then that would be, um, that definitely could happen. That's, that's how policy works. We update policy all the time. That's that's how this works. So and it and because it, that because that was an initiative that passed it, would that have to go to the voters then again for the, so for the changes? Was SB 10 an initiative? So I think that was just from the legislature or SB 10 would have been. So the, what, what, the was bill, that what is that what put this on the ballot? I wasn't sure. That's why I was wondering um, back um, in. No, no. So this is on the ballot through a protest referendum. This is the one protest referendum. So, so gotcha. the legislature passed it as a regular law. SB 10 was the law. And then we get to vote on yes or no. I believe that with a protest referendum, I think the legislature could still go back and change it. That's a really good question. You've stumped the professor. If the oh, people say me. yes on a protest referendum, <laughs> can the legislature still come back and change it? I'm gonna look into that. All right. With an initiative, the answer is no, the legislature can't right. change it. But with a protest referendum, I need to look into that. That's a really good question. Great. And then I think the um, uh, we got a few more that came in, but I think um, in the interest of time, I think our last one will be in this one. There is a little confusion on the inherent the inheritance tax um, issue on Prop 19 yeah. um, on what what that really um, uh, is all about. there. OK, so what happens uh, right now is um, if grandma had lived in her house for 40 years, and so she is paying or longer grandma's lived in her house forever and so she's paying property taxes that are based on the value of the house like back in the 1970s and grandma passes away and let's say you know her daughter inherits the house her daughter gets to keep as long as her daughter makes that house um well no sorry her daughter gets to keep paying property taxes based on that assessed value from the 70s so that's a sweet deal. Leave the house to your children and they get to keep that property tax break. Whereas if it's sold to somebody new, the property taxes would go way up. This closes that loophole um, in that if the daughter inherits and she makes it her primary residence, she can still keep the old assessed value. But what a lot of kids are doing is they inherit and then what they do is they rent out the house. So now it's a second home for the kids. If that's what you're doing, if it's not your primary residence, then you don't get to keep the old assessed value from the 70s. The assessed value would go up to the market price. So unless the, inherit, the person who inherits the house makes it their primary residence, the property taxes are going to go up to the current market value of the house. And that's a lot of money so that's going to close that loophole that the family can keep it in the family for but th what families are doing is keeping property in the family and keeping the low tax rate even though it's not their primary home they're not it's just keeping a low tax rate this would close that loophole and unless you make it your primary residence it's now assessed at the market value so that they threw that in to sweeten the deal on 19 so that the money we're losing from seniors moving is made up by closing the inherit property, inherited property tax loophole. It's messy. This is messy. When you this start building in lots of exceptions, it gets really messy. <laughs> yep. Well, Professor Hill, um, thank you so much for putting in the work um, on this as well. I kind of feel lazy that you've done all the work for me <laughs> and I was able to fill out my ballot as we were um, on here right now. And I'll mail this in tomorrow morning. I didn't have to read anything or anything else. I'm kidding, of course. Please um, uh, continue to study all these yes. things, everyone, as well. But thank you so much for giving us your time uh, for this as well. Um, this will be recorded um, and available on our YouTube channel um, later on um, this week. Um, and we want to, um, again, remind you that we have um, number three in our series coming up on uh, Friday, the uh, 24th, uh, 23rd, um, that is, at 12.30 uh, p.m. called um, Civility First. Um, how we can remain um, civil with one another, even though we may disagree on certain issues. So we hope to see you there as well. Professor Hill, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. It really means a lot. Thank you for voting. I love it. 
just yeah please get out the vote and again these are the resources where you can get more info if you'd like but really thank you for being here today and thank you bill and jessica for this awesome opportunity good night everyone thank you everyone good night as a reminder this presentation will be available on the kelsey fullerton alumni youtube channel later this week if you should have any additional questions that you're dying to ask, please feel free to send them to alumni events at fullerton.edu and we'll do our best to get them answered for you. Thank you so much again for joining us. Have a safe evening, everyone. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and be ending the meeting for everyone in just a moment. Just wanted to make sure everyone, there's no last minute questions, we're all set. Thank you again, everyone. I will be ending the meeting now for everyone. Have a good night. Thank you.